men comments of the other panelists. So mm. we start with you. Uh, let me just take the, the the questions in order. And actually, the, thank you, Bruce, for giving me an entree in order ans uh, into answering Jim's question is as to why the anti hacker uh, uh, why the anti hacker provision is in here is exactly the the reason that Bruce said we're not trying to close the door, the barn door after the last horse. You know the, the air attack. We're trying to uh, close the darn door for the barn door for the next horse, which is the cyber terrorist threat that uh, we all recognize and Bruce rely upon in order to uh, uh, press his case about uh, encryption. And the reason that we have the computer trespass uh, uh, provision there is exactly that, in order to anticipate and give us the tool in order to help defend such an attack when it is uh, uh, when it happens, rather than coming back here uh, 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 six months from now and says, "Whoops, you know, we forgot to close that door." Just as we just as we came back after September 12th, says God, we put all barricades down on the ground. We just forgot about the the, the use of airplanes as a uh, as a potential uh, weapon. <coughs> this provision is very very limited. One, it has to be upon invitation of the ISP. This is not a uh, free authorization for the uh, for the uh, law enforcement. An ISP already has that authority to protect their property, and this is this simply. Uh, recognizes that where there is a denial of service attack, we can also uh, have law enforcement come in and help defend that attack. And, the, and it's limited to the communications of the trespasser and not any thir third party uh, limitations. And so I think that once you get down into the weeds and you actually look at the, the, the language, as I encourage you all to do, uh, you, know, you will see the protection that we embed in here because we are, after all, you know, uh, the uh, privacy interest protection is the, the, as much as everybody else in this room. We just see uh, also the need in order to update the law to the, the, uh, to the uh, uh, technology with respect to the immediate question that Bruce raised with respect to the uh, 101 limitation. Why do we have all these back door ways? Why don't we close off the back door? Because we've already closed the front door. The provision it has says point blank, but not including the contents of such a communication. Point blank, at, at every single time that we uh, amend the, uh, the statute, we said, but not including the contents of such communication. <coughs> That's about its front door of protection as you, uh, uh, as you are uh, uh, going to get. Jim also brought up very rightly the significant change that, uh, the, that uh, the bill seeks with respect to the use of FISA authority from the purpose to a purpose. But this is not intended for us to be able to use foreign intelligence uh, tools, even when there, there's only 2% of foreign intelligence uh, uh, in the investigation. Quite often, foreign intelligence is done in tandem with criminal investigation. And so where there is such, the, such a tandem uh, investigation, there is a significant threat that we lose the information in court because the foreign information, uh, the, the FISA information was done not with a primary purpose, the 50% uh, the fifty percent mark. And Jim rightly calls for deliberation and for the, uh, for study. This has been done. The Bellows report internally with respect to the Wen Ho Lee case, the GAO report, which was just published in July of this year, and just yesterday, I believe, the House Intelligence Committee published its uh, report on this uh, uh, exact issue. And all of them, in one way or another, says that the primary purpose restriction is the result uh, is the reason why there is uh, lack of coordination between intelligence and criminal uh, uh, investigator, and that was what led to the, the, the problems we encountered specifically in the Wen Holy case and in other intelligence communications. We're not seeking a free roving authority to use FISA against the, uh, in criminal investigations. That's why we have acceded to and agreed to the Conyer Sensenbrenner modification of the change from the purpose to a purpose. We agreed to a significant purpose. All that we're trying to do here is trying to uh, meet the, uh, use the tools without uh, facing legal jeopardy. Mr. Pedesta? Uh, let me just say one more word about carnivore. Uh, there was a good hearing that the- DPS 1000. That the, uh, DPS whatever. <laughs> that I think that, that I recommend to you that the Senate Judiciary Committee did last year. There's a separate issue in carnivore, mm -hmm. which is whether in order to essentially analyze the uh, what is the non-content portion, even if you accept Viet's line, do you need to seize more than that in order to be able to kind of turn it through the machine, let the content go and look at it? That's an important Fourth Amendment question that I think is yet uh, to be uh, fully debated or at least fully resolved. But there, but so I think that's something that that probably the judiciary committees will will ultimately uh, tackle. But that I think it also argues again for at least a mid-ground standard. Uh, 
if not the if not the highest standard. Um, I think I'll let it go. Jim. Um, I guess I would say on uh, 106, the trespasser provision, the hard thing is what is authorized access and what isn't authorized access and what might be covered there. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't like to receive spam and you send me spam, you're getting unauthorized access to my computer. Or if an ISP says no, no use of a computer for a certain purpose or a system, I think that's unauthorized access and it does say to intercept the wire or electronic communications. Um, but I think that's a case where we need, to, you, when you do drill down to the words, the words are not that clear. And on the question of applying the pen register statute to the internet, I think let's come together over an intermediate standard. Um, it's already in 2703D for, I think, precisely some of the information that's being talked about. And I think that um, that's one that can be resolved uh, because there is information on the Internet that is in between an address. I mean, you take an IP address, an, an Internet protocol address looks a little bit like a telephone number. But then there's a lot of other signaling and routing and addressing information that doesn't look at all like a telephone number. And so it's not just that there are telephone numbers over here and there's content over here. There's a whole category of information in between that we need to think about. Two, two quick comments on the uh, content under pen register trap and trace. I, I think Congress should feel it has a responsibility to be as specific as possible and not just sort of set this up for a future lawsuit, which is the way it's headed right now. So, you know, there's an opportunity here to weigh in and be specific, and I think Congress should do so. Second, on carnivore, actually, I mean, in one sense, carnivore was exactly the right idea. And that's a little unusual for sort of a privacy advocate to say, but at least the FBI was trying to help itself. The FBI was trying to develop tools to address the modern uh, digital age. And rather than force industry in the private sector, as I said, to redesign and, and, uh, re and deploy new technologies that they hadn't, they, they came up with their own tool. Now, they bungled it in the way they did it. Whoever named it should be put in the kennel. But, I mean, it, 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 uh, it, it was conceptually the right approach. I mean, next time, hopefully, they'll roll it out with a little more independent review, giving people greater assurances, et cetera. But at least they were trying, you know, we do need to give law enforcement the tools to address crime in the modern age. Uh, I think we're all, we're all uh, agree on that. Well, uh, Bruce, we'll take your advice now and open it up to questions um, from, from the audience. Um, Jerry, we'll defer you for just a minute. Uh, Drew Clark? Yeah, I'm uh, Drew Clark from the Health Tech Daily. Mr. Dean, could you just comment on um, what your understanding of the Penrith Traffic Trace Standard is with regard to URLs and uh, whether that is signaling, addressing information, or whether it is content? the first URL, as well as subsequent URLs when visiting the website. Um, Richard, you want to take them down? I mean, Chris, you want to take a crack at this? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem that we're facing here, uh, I'm Chris Taylor, Deputy Chief of the Security Fire Service. The problem we're facing here is that it's not just trying to find a way terms like listing every term that we consider content, listing every term we don't consider content, because the technology changes. You don't want to have to revisit the statute every year or so. And I think everyone would agree, at least I think they would, that the IP numbers and certainly the hosting URL, like, you know, uh, cropduster.com, is the same type of telephone information as you get with a telephone number. It's called Home Depot, or called Crop Dusters or Us. Uh, when you get beyond that, that's still, the next page in, it's just like a department in the place. Now, if I think when we're dealing with even beyond that to the point of looking at, you know, what someone is actually transacting when they buying something, I think we'd agree that that is, you know, when you're actually buying something, that that is content. So I think we can draw the distinction. We don't now collect URL information. The FBI does not now collect it. But you can certainly imagine a case when it would be very important to find out, for instance, that a terrorist is going not only to, to chemicals.com, but going to the 
uh, you know, ammonium nitrate or whatever explosives paved with it. So I think you, know, you have to be able to get that kind of information. Yeah. Yeah. Which, of that, course, you can that, get that, under Title III. I mean, it's not that you can't get it, it's just the standard you need to get it. I, I think what's referenced earlier, the Title III standard is incredibly, incredibly high. And if you're talking about a device, you know, cap and trace are used, as we had said, early in the investigation. If you wall that off so that's not available to find out how, for instance, terrorists are communicating, that creates real problems. And I want to make just one small comment on the hacker trespass uh, thing that, uh, that Jim raised. It says in the proposal, unauthorized uh, access. It doesn't say beyond authorized access. It's not meant to apply to the spammer. It's not meant to apply to the person who exceeds their terms of service. That's not the point, and I think the language clearly reads that way. It's very limited. Everything here hangs on the difference between unauthorized access and access beyond, beyond authorized terms. Those are terms that are used in 1030. Too. That's a pretty subtle distinction on which to base an entire wiretap statute. I, I have a proposal for compromise. Which is that there's two late conyers and there's, there's, runners out there's, the door. Well, okay, okay, lady uh, has a, which is that there's already, the, you know, the, the, the attorney general under exigent circumstances can execute a, 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 a Title III and then go to court. Why not limit that kind of a provision to if, if what you're really concerned about is uh, the situation where the, where you're under attack, whether you're under a cyber attack to a 48 hour or, or a reasonable limitation on time before you have to go to court and say we, we want authorization to continue the surveillance of this person. Yeah, that, that would make sense if there were a privacy interest that is at stake. Right now we're talking about a the the privacy interest of a hacker, Based an unauthorized, uh, the, the, an unauthorized ac accessor. And actually there is clear expl explicit language here that, that, that it makes clear that it's not to beyond the expectation of the, beyond the authorization. It says a person who accesses a protect computer without authorization. Seems to me that's a clear the, the phrasing that, that that does not include beyond authorization. Let me just add one thing to that. We did an investigation of the denial of service attacks that Jim mentioned back in February about a year and a half ago. There were computers that were being used by the attackers where the companies wanted us or the educational institutions wanted law enforcement to come in. They didn't have the capability themselves to monitor their own networks. They wanted to invite us in. But there are real problems. And when you tell companies this, when you tell ISPs this, they sort of throw up their hands and say, this is nuts. And it is. Because again, these are, and this is really meant to apply to the unauthorized intruder, not the person who's exceeding their terms. But it's unauthorized based upon whose determination? That of the law enforcement officer deciding it's what is authorized. The ISP and, well, then, yeah, oh. So we're deferring the judgment to the judgment of the ISP to say, th this guy's authorized, this guy's not authorized, no. wiretap Jim, this guy. Again, under 1030, yeah. it's unauthorized, unauthorized, and exceeding authorization. It's already there in 1030. Mr. Berman? My question. question. Where you're coming, where all of these statutes and every piece of legislation is a contract between the people and a government about what it's doing, that it seems to me, I, I have heard no argument why delicate and complicated provisions like this are on a track to pass and pass in both houses without the dialogue, uh, even a weak dialogue between uh, uh, people who are, who are concerned about this and the possibility of writing report language or modifying language to make intent clear because you're from civil libertarian and the public and we worry about the and uh, on the other hand, you are opening yourself up to litigation, which I think in every other case of national security legislation, we have been able to work with administration, policymakers, and find solutions very fast, but it requires dialogue and, and, and uh, trying to, to make the life line more precise. Um, I will take full responsibility for the, uh, for the process because that is a, uh, that is, uh, one that uh, 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 a timetable that both the Attorney General, the Vice President, and President have uh, uh, have asked the Congress uh, to do. The exigencies of the circumstances, I think, uh, uh, need not be uh, stressed uh, uh, again here. It's done so much already in the uh, in the public arena that I would not bore you with it. With respect to the dialogue, I completely completely agree with you, Jerry. The the and that's why this uh, this process has progressed the way that, that it has. The First, uh, the first 
uh, time that the, AG, uh, the Attorney General even mentioned that we are thinking about putting together a legislative package was on uh, was on Sunday two weeks ago, and then as a, uh, almost immediately, I think on Monday, the Washington Post put on its website the, the, a uh, set of draft uh, uh, proposals, and the, and the uh, dialogue started uh, happening with Congress on Wednesday. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Attorney General and the Council of the President met with all the leaders of the uh, committees and of uh, and of Congress on Thursday. Uh, I went and uh, all the Department of Justice went and had a full briefing for the House Judiciary uh, uh, Committee uh, on, on the uh, very specific uh, uh, issues. On Friday of that same week, I went and had a full set of briefing to the staff of the Senate uh, uh, Judiciary, and all of those processes have continued uh, in, ongoing, uh, uh, in an ongoing fashion. You will recall that the following Tuesday, the, uh, the, set, the, the uh, House Judiciary Committee had a full hearing in which, at which the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, AAG Chertoff, and myself testified with respect to particulars of the bill. And if you recall, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you were there, the House Judiciary Committee had a, uh, had a briefing with, with the uh, civil, liberties, uh, civil liberties groups in order to uh, uh, air some of those concerns. We were there. We were listening. Everybody was there. We have been working nonstop since those hearings, including the Senate hearing that was uh, last Tuesday with the uh, AG testifying with at the staff level, at the member level. We've had plenty of meetings with uh, uh, every single person who has any question about this. And so the consultation process, although concentrated, has been extraordinarily deliberate because everybody recognizes the importance not only of the need for the proposals, but also the need, as you correctly point out, to protect our uh, uh, core liberty so that we don't sacrifice our values uh, uh, in this uh, process. Report writing, I'm not a le I'm, I don't believe in legislative history, nor do I think that that's the right way to, uh, to do the uh, statutes uh, uh, to, the extent that, uh, to the extent that we can clarify it in the text, let's go for it. And, 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 and we've been working with staff nonstop in order to work, uh, uh, work on, the, uh, 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 on the text because I do not think legislative history adds very much at a uh, interpretive level, nor should it add very much to the judicial making process. And so that's just make work. Questions? Terry Lane was walking in that daily. Um, it's not like there's a lot of debate over the, the definition of some of these terms in the legislation. Is there a significant case law that already exists which, which might come back on these terms, or do you think the case that might be new case law have to be different? Um, with respect to the core issue where the pedal meets the n uh, metal with respect to content and URL and stuff like that, my understanding is that, that no, there is no case law because uh, you know, for the first time we're trying to, uh, to extend the uh, pen trap to, uh, to uh, electronic communications. There is converse case law. With, uh, is there converse case law with respect to the subject line? Is that what I understand? Or is that just our department position? I'm not sure if it's in our department position because content is defined in the wiretap section. Another thing. Right. With respect to other stuff like the FISA uh, 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 amendment, uh, Jim is right to correct that there to to, uh, to note that there is significant case law out there with respect to the constitutionality of the FISA uh, regime. Uh, each one of you uh, in your uh, offices or your members should have a letter that went out late last night uh, giving the department's legal analysis uh, from the Office of Legal Counsel regarding the constitutionality of the uh, proposed change. And, uh, uh, you know, this letter, I apologize for its uh, uh, tardiness. I mean, it's a week, uh, hence, and I know a lot of you have been asking, but we want to make absolutely sure that we cross the T's and adopt the I's and make sure that we give you our best considered judgment as a department and as an administration with respect to the constitutionality of this uh, of the proposal. And we, it is our considered judgment that it is indeed constitutional. Yes. Uh, Tim Wright is the Uh, I don't know. The situation is is fluid, and and I cannot uh, uh, I cannot comment on the uh, progress of negotiations except for that which is already common knowledge, which is the fact that uh, those provisions have been dropped, and uh, we do not object to that. Uh, uh, we're not going to pick a fight on that uh, on that uh, uh, battle on the battleground. In the in the uh, should be I think it should be noted that in the uh, in the uh, embassy bombing cases that were tried this spring, uh, Judge Sand permitted the introduction of evidence of a foreign wiretap 
that was done in Kenya against a U.S. citizen who was part of the, it, the case is actually U.S. B. Osama bin Laden. Uh, so that, that there is some history that they don't need this authority uh, under the current FISA statute. Yeah, that's exactly the, the, the consideration we had is how much practical use it is. It is really a clarity in the, in the law. We already, I think the law is clear, but what it is is that you actually have to go and litigate every single time rather than if you have a blanket provision here, a USA can have this admission without uh, litigating. You know, it's not the, you know, the, the marginal benefit of that clarity. It seems to me the, uh, the, as outweighed by the, by the considerations led to its dropping. So we made a considered judgment not to object to that dropping. It seems like the same could be said about the, the somewhat controversial notice provision uh, on the churches. Uh, do you think the lay notice under the price? Uh, delay notice under search warrants generally that's the uh, what is uh, uh, delay notice or the, uh, this is significantly different from the quote unquote sneak and peek proposal that you've seen in the past this is just simply a delayed uh, uh, delayed notice uh, the provision you're right to correct uh, you're right to note that uh, uh, there is uh, Unlike the uh, foreign wiretap uh, 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 area where there, I think there's clear and consistent law which is seeking a, a blanket uh, authority uh, for admissibility, in the delay notice, or at least in the core sneak and peek area, you have some conflicting law. You've got the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit going one way and I believe three other circuits going the other way. What we're trying to do there is seek uniformity in the law, admittedly, with respect to the narrow uh, uh, provision we have, delaying notice. Uh, and and uh, and I think you're right to, to say that 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 is one of those provisions that is uh, that is seeking clarity rather than uh, or uniformity rather than substantively changing the law. So is that one that you'll be Well, let me say this: the the the, the Conyers Sensenbrenner uh, effort is is a very very uh, uh, good package that I think preserves the core of uh, what we are seeking and that which we are, that we absolutely need uh, in the uh, 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 in the package. It obviously had some very troublesome uh, uh, provisions. Uh, uh, most significantly, the, you know, we, we all know what uh, they are, the, the, the two-year sunset the, the, uh, provision the, the, uh, the, the, uh, and some others like that, that we can uh, go in specific for, specifically the uh, uh, specific uh, uh, provisions of the previous uh, HR 5018 and things like that, that uh, and, and the definition of engaging in terrorist activity and foreign terrorist organizations that we have to take very much closer look at. With, with those specific care caveats, I think that the, uh, the bipartisan effort of the Con uh, Conyers Sense and Brenner uh, bill is actually the, uh, quite good in achieving uh, our core objectives uh, on, uh, in this process. That's why we've been, uh, we've, uh, been working so hard to try and explain it to the, uh, the, the Judiciary Committee members so that they can come up with a package that uh, meets our interest and at the same time go through the proper uh, channels of consultation and deliberation that uh, even though in a concentrated uh, basis that Jerry advocated. No additional questions. We'll um, just one, one minute to wrap things up for the panelists. Final word. I just thank you all, and uh, and I hope we our conversation uh, continues. And uh, thank you for being part of this uh, effort. I, I I would just say we kind of danced around a little bit the information sharing provisions uh, in in this legislation. I think they are maybe the most profound and significant provisions in in, in the bill, which per which essentially take down the hard walls between law enforcement and intelligence investigations, between uh, material that's developed by the grand jury and subject to grand jury secrecy rules and bleeds over into both intelligence and, and law enforcement investigations. I think because this is the Internet Caucus, we didn't really talk that much about it, but that is a very far-reaching, significant uh, uh, difference between the way FBI proceeded in the past and the way this new war on terror will proceed in the future. Uh, and it has, you know, it's something uh, that I think needs uh, vigilance and constant oversight from the Congress to make sure that that's being done in a way that, that all preserves civil liberties but also preserves operational security because I think there's, there's tremendous problems in having so much of that information bleed out to so many people. I saw someone in the Wall Street Journal, maybe in one of your stories, who was a sheriff in Louisiana who said, we need this information down here uh, in order to stop terrorism. And there's, uh, I guess maybe he does, but it also from an operational security perspective, I think that caused me to sort of take, take, you know, take a second look at those provisions. Jim? The, um, I would just say in conclusion that the FBI and the intelligence agencies need 
um, the legal authorities to um, respond to terrorism and other kinds of crimes. The only debate we're having here is the debate over what are the legal standards and are there legal standards and do we have a judge in the process here serving the constitutional role of um, focusing and guiding the efforts of the executive branch. And what we're talking about here is maintaining a system of checks and balances. I just second it on checks and balances. I mean, people are getting closer, not further apart, the more time is spent on it. I mean, consensus on a lot of provisions is developing. I just encourage all of you to continue working on it. Um, you know, it, you, you have the role to play in crafting this legislation and, and forging that consensus on the remaining differences. Um, on behalf of the advisory committee, I'd like to thank staff for attending. I'd particularly, I'd like to thank the expert panel, including Mr. Din, who took so much time out of his uh, incredibly busy schedule. Congressman Goodlatte, thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>